everybody, and welcome to this Tuesday's In Power Coffee Break with our special guest, Liz Wanger. Uh, who we're going to be talking about personal branding and branding and how challenging it is to market yourself, um, but some ways of thinking about marketing yourself and your personal brand that are authentic and natural. Uh, as we do with every coffee break, we'll um, invite people who can listen in uh, onto the line uh, via the chat or Q&A uh, of our webinar, and this recording will go up at coffeebreak.empowercoaching.com, where you can also see upcoming topics as well. Uh, we cover topics like how to survive and thrive in the workplace, uh, women in leadership, uh, how to build a pro-employee workplace, whether you're the leader who's leading uh, in your corporate culture or whether you are responsible from an HR or other executive position. So we always invite new topic ideas and we encourage you to participate at coffeebreak.empowercoaching.com. So Mary, why don't you introduce Liz and we'll jump into today's conversation about speaking your value. Sure. So today, Liz Wanger is joining us, and she's a sought-after communication strategist known for bringing clear thinking, fresh perspectives, and practical solutions to companies, nonprofits, and government agencies. As president of Wanger Group, a consulting company she founded in 2000, she has worked with a variety of corporate, government, and nonprofit clients to enhance their ability to get their point across to internal and external stakeholders. Liz is on a mission to help people connect their work and enterprises to the people they need and want to reach to grow their organizations, influence actions, and behavior and drive revenue. Prior to founding her firm, Liz was Director of Communications for the Moreno Institute, Moreno Group in Reston, Virginia. She has also held senior communication positions at the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the American Institute of Architects, where she directed national media and advertising campaigns. She was also a reporter at the Washington Post on the Metro and Style Desks and worked in the Social Service Department at the Massachusetts General Hospital. She is a certified professional facilitator. Liz was named as a 2015 Women Who Mean Business honoree by the Washington Business Journal, and she blogs regularly for the Huffington Post Business section, and her work has appeared in the Washington and Baltimore Business Journals, the Washington Post, and numerous trade publications. She currently serves on the boards for the School of Et for Ethics for Global Leadership, Jubilee Housing, and the National Speakers Association DC chapter. She has also served on the board of leadership of Greater Washington, Child Trends, and Mid-Atlantic Facilitators Network. So welcome, Liz. Great to be here with you all. Um, you know, Liz, you and I kind of bonded over marketing and being a recovering marketing marketer myself, even though I'm in coaching now. You know, the commonality between the challenges that people, that marketers have marketing products and services and businesses aren't that different from the challenges we have as individuals um, presenting ourselves in a way that is attractive to the people we want to attract, whether it's in a networking context, looking for a job, you know, trying to do your own job better. Um, and I was really intrigued when we started, when you were talking with Mary about, you know, this conversation about speaking value and your blog posts last week on speaking value. Um, you know, that's such a, it seems like such a no brainer concept, right? We shouldn't just be speaking in platitudes and things don't make any list of bullets, you know, stuff that just doesn't make any sense jargon. Um, how did you kind of key into this idea for yourself that speaking value is what matters? And what does that really mean to you? Yeah, well, I think what happens is that there's so much, um, so many platforms and so many ways that we can communicate and so much of what goes on is inauthentic or just a lot of drivel. I mean, we're, we're, there's, I mean, there really is. There's just, you know, we're bombarded with information and, and so on. And when I started to think about how is it that some people cut through the clutter, some people stand out, some people you want to listen to, it's because they're communicating, they're somehow connecting with what matters to you. And you the audience. So well, often, yeah. they're, really, they're really focused on, on the audience and they know who their audience is. And what happens to most of us is, for lots of reasons, I think, we, we tend to speak through a prism of me. In other words, everything that we do is refracted through our own set of eyes. And what matters to us. So when we're thinking about creating a personal brand, we tend to want to talk about the things that we think 
distinguish us or uh, are important to us, that matter to us, and they may or may not matter to the people that you're trying to connect with. And so it's, it's, and, 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 and it's very hard to get out of that prism of me. Um, you know, if you go to a networking event, and I go to far too many sometimes, I think, and if you're sitting around a table and people are asked to introduce themselves, they will typically say, I'm Susie Smith, and I am a, an architect, an engineer, a communication strategist. And that by itself, that tells me what you do, but it doesn't really say, well, what's the benefit of that to me? And it's a lot harder to think about that because that involves understanding who you're talking to and getting to know them and understand what matters to them. Yep. Well, and you know, um, my own experience with this is twofold. And I'm talking about from a coach's perspective, you know, coaching people to try to mm -hmm. be able to articulate their personal brand more clearly. One thing is, is that even though we have the prism, prism of me, I love that image, we often don't know ourselves all that well. Yes. And, and so when we're talking, we're discovering ourselves in front of other people. <laughs> yes. And so we're, the prism of me is really me. Oh, like, hey, someone will listen to me. Let me talk and see what comes out. And, right. and so uh, the getting out of the prism of me do, means doing some of that work ahead of time before you're in front of somebody influential that you want to impact. So you can kind of, you know, figure out who you are and who you want to present, you know, what aspects of yourself you want to present. And then, the, and then that's kind of task number one. And then task number two is, as you said, learning more about the person you're going to be talking about either by researching them on LinkedIn or by just asking them when you're meeting with them. So many of the times we just start like, I'm a this, this is what I do, I do. And there's no question about what the other person does. So you have no insight into how what you do relates to them. And so those are two different skill sets. You know, one is knowing yourself and what you want to present. And the other is knowing how to learn about your audience and then present the you you want to present in a way that's relevant to them. And those are two distinct tasks. And it's, it takes me back to when I was marketing products. You know, we talked about this. How are you a bag of chips? You know, right. <laughs> I, want you, I want to hear your version of this. Um, because when you're marketing a product, it, you have to do the same thing. You have to understand, well, what are, what's good about this product? You know, how does it work? What is it? And then you have to understand your audience and how to present it. So right. when you look at people, I mean, how are we a bag of chips? And how are we really not a bag of chips? <laughs> well, so I, it's, it's hard to, I, I don't know that anybody wants to think of themselves as a bag of chips. But the way that I look at this is, uh, so I talked about the prism of me, and well, there's a prism of value. And when you think about the prism of value, let's talk about the first part, is how do you get to know yourself? And what, the way that we think about this uh, prism of value is if you think of a prism as taking white light, refracting it, and at the other end is beautiful technicolor. <laughs> so if you think of the white light, as all the things that you think you know about yourself, that you think matter about yourself. And if you refract it through the prism of value by asking yourself questions, in what ways have I made other people's lives better? And in what ways have I reduced or eliminated negatives for other people? Mm -hmm. How have I done that? And really, so in order to know yourself, you have to step back and really try to understand that, not make, not devolve into what I call list speak, where you're sort of listing out, and then I went here, or I, I worked at this shelter, and I helped these people, but what was the impact of what you did? How did you make something better? And that's hard to do. It's hard to, to think about, and it's why probably more people aren't necessarily communicating their value, because they haven't taken that step to look at what it is that they actually have contributed and to whom and in what ways. Everything we do in life is a value exchange. I'm gonna spend time, my friends, who, I'm, who, who, who are my friends and who count me as a friend, because we all get something out of the investment of time or uh, we feel better, maybe an emotional thing. You know, it, your contribution might be, you just know how to make people feel better. Um, you know, you know how to make people feel at ease. That, that's, a, that's a value that, that you 
offer and is part of your, your brand. Um, so it's really looking at all of those things, emotional, intellectual, uh, you know, if you're athletic, physical, um, all the things that you have, uh, your skills and things that you do, and what's the impact of that? To, to um, other people. To other people. And, and, to other, and so, you know, you can ask other people. I mean, sometimes that, could, that, that, that can feel threatening. But again, in marketing, you know, to try to understand, that's why you, we get inundated with surveys all the time. Because market, you know, companies are trying to ask us what worked about their product. How do we use the product? I, I know my bank asks me this question all the time. Could you imagine a world without us? The answer is yes. But I, I think it's interesting <laughs> that, they, that, they, that they ask that question. And um, every, after every engagement in the, in the branch, I get a survey asking me how it was, right, mm -hmm. and how they could improve. So, again, it's, it's thinking like that. This is how we can be, if, you know, more like a, a product is to think of ourselves and in relation to other people and what is our effect on other people. So, uh, you know, I understand that. You know, you're, you're saying that, and I'm remembering an experience I had, like, literally last week, I think, that I think is exactly what you're talking about. Let me, let me explain it, and you can tell me if it is. So I was giving a workshop on preparing your LinkedIn summary and your resume. And obviously, in the workshop, we couldn't, like, sit. I wasn't going to have them sit and write their resumes, but we were – I spent a whole section on accomplishments and how important it is to be able to talk about your accomplishments. And several people really had a hard time understanding what an accomplishment was. You know, they kept saying, well, I do this. And it's like, yeah, but that's, not a, that's an activity, not an accomplishment. And this one light bulb went off with this woman. Uh, and, she, and, she, and I said, well, what do you do? And she said, well, I, I do these needs assessments. I said, great. I said, how many have you done in the last, you know, 10 years of your employment? And she's like, oh, hundreds. I'm like, well, name one that actually, you know, the assessment information was used by the client to make a critical decision that allowed them to improve their business. And she looked completely blank and she goes, I have no idea. And the people sitting next to her went, no, you actually, we know you have. And you know, they said, Bob and Bill, you know, go talk to them. Ask them what decisions they made based on your information, your assessment, your analysis, and you will get answers. And she just looked like, I never thought about that. <laughs> but as right. soon as she started to think about that people did things with what she produced, it was really kind of revelatory for her. She just went back. She goes, I've got to rethink how I present myself completely because I know people take action on what I do. I just don't know what that is. And that's where we said, well, you, you need to go find out because when you can explain that, that's when other people are like, well, I want you to come in and do that for me so that I can make those kinds of decisions. It was really kind of interesting. Yeah, and what, and what she was doing was devolving into list speak, which we all do. Uh, and, and we all know, uh, you know, personally, we'll, we'll say, here's my experience. I used to do it myself um, when I was talking about my own firm. And I would talk to people about being a strategic communications consultant and having done all these things. And what I now say to people is we help you get your point across because that's really what you're trying to do. You're trying to get your point across so that other people understand you that other people value you, mm -hmm. uh, that other people appreciate what you're doing. And, and, and we, we, we do that through by helping you figure out the best ways to do that, how to frame it, conversation, so on. But if I, if I went in and just talked as a strategic communications consultant, that, I can't picture that. I don't understand what that is. I might have, and there are many definitions of what that might be. So, it took me a while, actually, to figure out how to express that for myself, and I do this for a living. I mean, I was really good at helping other people do it, uh, but I ran myself through my own prism of value. In what way are we making something positive happen for people, and in what way are we reducing or eliminating something negative? And it's both of those things. You can't just do one or the other. You need to answer both of those questions, and imagine if you looked at everything you did through that prism, it would really change. It seems very simple, but it would really change how you think about things. Uh, in, in the organizations that we work with, people use that uh, prism as a way to make decisions about what things we're gonna highlight, what things we're not. What, um, some, some people have even started to think about, oh, I'm, uh, I was talking to somebody in HR and when I was, and I was testing 
the prism of value with her, this concept. And she said, I've never thought about the way we recruit that way. I've never thought about how we could frame to the talent that we're trying to recruit what it is that we're giving to them other than, than the opportunity to make a lot of money. Right. Uh, so, so really rethinking how they, how they, how they look at that. And that's, and, and that's what this is, this is all about. It's really, it's not about, you know, creating better messages. It's about connecting and engaging with other people that, 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 that matter to you. So that, so, and, and that they see that why they, sh you should matter to them. So, so let's talk about one of the reasons and Mary, I'm going to ping on you here in, in just a second. Can't go by without bringing Mary in because he's got <laughs> such good ideas. Uh, we talked a little bit about this, about how, you know, why don't people do that? Well, sometimes we can't get out of our own, you know, we can't get through that first step of understanding ourselves well enough or learning to listen. So those are problems. But another one is the confidence thing. You know, having the confidence to claim I actually help somebody, right? And um, we do think of this often as sort of a women's issue because women often have challenges with confidence. But in this workshop I was talking about, the men were having similar challenges. And I don't know if it's because they were more introverted or what, or they're more analytical, you know, kind of analysts, not front people. But my point is, it's not really just a gender thing. I think that when it comes to talking about our own value, it's one thing to, to be able to talk about a product's value because it's that thing and it's not me. But somehow if I talk about my own value, I feel very vulnerable, right? I feel vulnerable because if people say, no, that's not valuable, or you didn't really produce that much, that's like that I, we take it personally. And so coming to understand your value in a way that you're comfortable speaking about it authentically is kind of another work activity, right? It's another challenge to get to that point. And Mary, I want to pick on you because, you know, you've, you're in an entrepreneurial role and you've kind, of, you've kind of gone through this journey of learning to speak about yourself and your value with confidence. Uh, what have you learned? Because <laughs> I think you was a very confident speaker on that subject, but I know you were always weren't. No, no. I think a lot of it comes from um, working in user experience. You always have to prove yourself in an organization and prove like why you should just exist, right? Why should anyone pay for you? <laughs> so I'd have to come out um, and after every project talk with my clients or keep, um, or keep tabs on them and what they're doing. And my clients were fine with that. And they'd sometimes just email me like, this was the result we got. Like, we know you've moved on and you're on another project. This is the result we got because we know you need that. So I got used to communicating in terms of like case studies um, and talking about what I contributed to the bottom line, right? Because mm -hmm. again, I'm like, you need me, uh, justification, right? Mm -hmm. And I know it's money. <laughs> Um, and then the other thing that I started finding out too, and this gets into a more soft skill of value, I think, Liz, when you're talking about even when you add the value of um, just like bringing like the nicety to a group, um, I started realizing like people were hiring me just because I was easy to work with. And I heard about this in a really bad way. <laughs> it's a terrible story. Um, I was at a conference and a colleague, um, I was talking to a colleague. And um, I was telling him how I was working with this one particular client. And he was like, oh, yeah, I was talking with them, too. And I'm like, oh, OK. And then he goes, oh, I decided to work with this other client because the project was much more exciting than, that, than the one you're working on. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, really? Like, that's kind of insulting. Um, but then I realized why um, I was getting more calls than this other guy was. And it was because I was just easier to work with. Like, it wasn't necessarily about the quality of work. They just didn't want to deal with, like, what he just did. Like, what nonsense is that? <laughs> <laughs> what ego is that, right? It was crazy. Well, so, and, and it's interesting, though, that you, you recognize that, but that you were willing to say, oh, that's something I'm good at and that has value. A lot of people don't. Yeah. They just go, oh, good, people don't hate me. <laughs> you know? I, I would actually tell some of my clients this. I would be like, I know sometimes I might not be necessarily the best choice of the lot, but you will have an easier time working with me. And I'd say it a different way, of course, nicer, right? But it was, that would be the gist. Like, I'm going to be easy to work with. I'll get you your stuff fast and like, we'll get through the process. We'll get something done. You know, I might not be the best, 
but you won't have any drama. <laughs> I hope Again, you find a better way to say it. I, put, I, I did. I, I put it in a better way. Yeah, I, I put it in a better way, but that was the gist of the, what I would kind of, kind of position it. Right. Kind of spin it. Liz, what's your experience with finding confidence, you know, helping your clients find confidence uh, to, to, to be able to make the claim, you know, that I, that you offer value, that you, that you will deliver value. Right. I think um, to the points that you were just making, I think it's hard for people to see themselves. They, they're wearing a certain dark glasses when it comes to looking at them. Dark glasses in the me prism. Oh my God. Right. There are dark glasses stumbling around in the me prism and they can't sometimes see what, what it is that they have to offer. And that is why it is good to get out of yourself and ask other people, well, what, what was it that I did? You know, you can be talking to a boss. What was it that I did on this project that you felt really added value that made this project more successful? What did you think my contribution was? I mean, Asking people, because people see you, I think sometimes we're our own worst critics. Oh, yeah. We're much harder on ourselves than anybody else could be. And so in many ways, just in the same way that we'll go into a company to do messaging and communications uh, his work, and we can help them see, you know, what you're doing is really cool. You should be talking about that. And they go, well, well that's just, well, everybody does that. Oh. No, everybody doesn't do that. Or not everybody does it that way. We were with a big construction company the other day, and they were talking about some of the technology that they use to, uh, to build virtually before, before the building even goes up. And, and sure, lots of companies are doing that. Uh, but I said, but people who aren't in the industry and just general business people may not know anything about that. And they would find that really interesting. And, and they, they were starting to think, wow, that is something that we do, and we do it differently from some of the other, maybe we should talk about that more. So it's, it's really, you know, getting that trusted kind of kitchen cabinet uh, of people, of whether it's, uh, you know, clients that you have or colleagues that you have or past uh, bosses that you've had where that, that, can say, that you can ask them, what was it? What did I do that added value? And listen for words. These are value words. Obviously, eliminate, you know, bad things, reduce, increase, improve, create. Uh, those, are, those are value type of words as opposed to just simply listing activity. I, I completed so many projects. I completed 100. Um, you, know, I, you know, okay, that's great. But uh, were they any good? You well, know. and actually, and, and like that, I completed 100, which was two times as many as anyone ever had, you know, or something. Right, right. At right. least you begin to put value on it in that sense. You can put, and, you know, were you the first to do something like that? Uh, was, uh, were you the only ones to do that? Have you taken a process and maybe married it with something else in a way that's, that's different? I mean, very little is original uh, these days. But it's the way we go about it. And to what Mary was saying, you know, being easy to work with, that's very valuable to people. I mean, we expect that you'll, when, when people are looking to bring in firms, and, you know, to hire or, or when you're looking to hire people, we expect that people get to a certain part of our screening, have the skills to do something. So then it becomes, well, what do you like to work with? Are you a good cultural fit? Yes. Um, uh, and how can you demonstrate that? And you want to, in, as much as possible in the way you describe oh. yourself, is to show people. So you want to paint pictures with words, you know, not talk about oh. creating strategies, but did you create tools that, were able, that people were able to use? Because now I can picture a tool, but it's hard for me to picture a strategy in my head, right? And being able to then make a statement and back it up with, well, and then... I had this client or I had this project and these were the challenges and we were able to do this, this, and this because, or I saw a way that we could bring this and this together and that made the difference in getting the project done on time or on budget, something like that. And, and I have to say, you know, with my clients, when I encourage them to do what you're talking about, which is go get a kitchen cabinet, you know, ask your boss, ask trusted people 
what you've done and what kind of value you offer. It is amazing to me how many times they come back and go, I was so afraid they would say terrible things. And they said such great things. And they gave me constructive feedback. You know, they gave me a new way to look at myself in ways that I can improve. But everyone's always blown away that the fears they carry about what they'll learn when they ask for that kind of feedback to understand their own value are often unfounded. Well, and we often wait until we're, we're leaving a company or I was joking with somebody. I had a client, a very long-standing client for many years and they decided to bring their communications work in house. And so I sent out a little email saying, you know, I wasn't going to be working with them any longer. And I got all these emails back from people. How wonderful. I said, I feel like I just died. You know, that, that people tend to say these things when, you know, when you're dying or when, when you're leaving a company or whatever. And we really ought to be getting that kind of feedback all the time and not be afraid of it and not be afraid. Hopefully people will deliver it in a nice way, but if there are things you can improve, you need to hear that too. It's Absolutely. Important. Absolutely. Well, we're almost at the end of the hour. So I just want to ask in terms of wrap up, um, you know, what, what would you say is like the one thing that people can do to make speaking their value a habit? So you talked about how we should always be getting, not wait till we have to put our resume together or, you know, till there's an event to ask people for insight about where we add our, where we add value. What, what else would you suggest for how to be, make this a habit? And then Mary, right. I'd like your thoughts too. So I would say, try to complete the following sentence. I am or I do X, Y, and Z. And because of that, others are able to do something else. So complete that. I am this, and therefore, this is what happens to other people. Or I do this, and therefore, someone's able to do something that they want to do. And if you can use that as a way to frame, that's the prism of value. What am I contributing positively? What am I contributing? What am I reducing negatively? That's great. And that is awfully simple, isn't it, right? And, and yep. if you don't know the answer, it's easy to ask people. Help me Correct. fill in the blank. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Mary, what have you found helpful for you to kind of turn it into a habit to understand your value? Um, focus on results. Like, how are you contributing? Like, I always look at every gig I'm on. Um, like, I, and I think this is, this is even true for work. Like, every day, as, well, as a consultant, I'm like, every day that I show back up means I was rehired, right? I always take it. So every day I have to contribute, right? I have to do, contribute in some way. Um, and then always try to think of how are you adding value? That's all. And sometimes I try to do get um, concrete results for the bottom line as much as possible. Cause again, it's business, right? How am I contributing? But that's what I try to try to focus on. And I think if people did that in their jobs, they'd be surprised at how much they do contribute to the bottom line and um, you know, and how it might not be directly measurable, but they might do something like they create um, a program that gets people interested in something that gets other things happening. Like what Liz was saying, like what's the cause and effect type of thing. I, I think that's, I love that idea that every day you show up, you're getting rehired, which is not just by the way for consultants, it's true for people who are hired too. Um, and, I, and I agree that when you, when you put yourself to the test of, you know, what am I contributing? It also helps you prioritize where you put your energy because you going yes. back, you could do all these activities, but, which are the activities that are going to have the greatest potential for making people's lives better, for moving things forward, you know, for creating results. Um, and when we put our own choices into those filters, uh, you know, we usually come up with a different response than just if we're like, well, here's all this stuff I could do. What should I do right now? And then I would give my own advice, by the way, in this category of what can we can do regularly, um, which is not to, to learn to believe our own value. And what I mean by that is a lot of times people say, well, I can't prove that I did it. Or I can't give anyone a guarantee that if they hire me, this will happen. And we get stuck up on this proof and guarantee. And, you know, we can't be 100% confident. So I don't want to say it at all. And we have to find authentic ways to believe our own value and to say, like you said, I can't guarantee I'm going to give you the exact best. But I can guarantee that I'm gonna give you my all, that the results I've created for others, I will do my darndest to create for you. 
And then if we can't create those results, I'll figure out why and we'll come up with another plan. And so finding like, well, okay, maybe you can't off, you know, 100% guarantee something. What can you guarantee? What can you commit? And, and be comfortable believing that that has value because it does. It absolutely does. Um, and a lot of the times we just don't let ourselves believe that anything less than perfection has value. And that's simply not true. We'd no, nobody would get through life <laughs> if, we only, if we only did the things we believed had 100% value. Uh, you know, we have to, we have, to have a belief uh, that supports us uh, kind of along the way. And that takes practice to come up with what we do believe that has value and then to learn to speak it and stand up for it um, and do it. <laughs> so, well, we're out of time, but this has been a great conversation. I recommend folks go back and uh, read Liz's post if you haven't. There's a link to it on the page announcing this talk. And uh, we will see you next Tuesday at uh 10 a.m. Pacific and 1 p.m. Eastern on the InPower Coffee Break. You can find that schedule at uh, InPower, excuse me, coffeebreak.empowercoaching.com. You can also sign up for reminders and invitations the day of that will give you login information and tell you who we'll be interviewing. So we encourage you to sign up for that. And Liz, I want to really thank you for uh, coming and sharing your perspective here. It's really, I love it because, you know, it's stuff, it's stuff I think we all know, but I love the dark glasses and the prism and, and there are things we don't know, you know, which is uh, how much this relates to just the common challenge of communicating value, no matter what it is you're communicating about. Cool. Really appreciate well, it. It was my pleasure to be here. All right, good. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody.